over the devil and you're going to have to quit letting him negatize you. <laughs> that's about the best way to do it. And that's called oppression, vexation. You want to quit allowing this stuff into your life. You want to quit, oh, have mercy on me, oh, hallelujah. My God, stand up, you are a warrior. You forget that you are a warrior in the army of God and quit acting like, uh, uh, what's those that, that, uh, that leave? You know, they run away, what they're called. Can't think of it right now. Deserter. Quit acting like you're a deserter. I, I, I understand. I'm starting to understand why I'm preaching some of this stuff I've been preaching. Because you need to become a warrior for God. And your weapons are not carnal. They're not natural is what it means. Your weapons are not natural, but they are mighty through God. What are you doing? You're pulling down the strongholds of the devil. You're casting down the imagination and thoughts of the devil. That's what the Bible says you are to do. The Bible says you are a, a good soldier, cannot entangle himself with the fires of this life. Only the strong will survive. I can tell you that now. I'm going to preach to you the 91st Psalm. The 91st Psalm is a wonderful, powerful psalm. I read it over my life, over my family, over my home, over Abundant Grace Tabernacle, because the Bible tells you to. And it's one of the most, it's, a, it's not a, a, a psalm of praise. Most of the, now these, these are songs that's uh, composed by different artists and uh, different writers, Moses, David, and Asap, and just various ones. Uh, but they are songs that David used to uh, sing in the tabernacle when he worshiped God. And so I want to just lay you a little bit of foundation about David and how the tabernacle of David come, come about. And everybody knows it's got a, if you know anything about the Bible, the Bible says in Acts chapter 15, uh, James quoted this that uh, uh, from Amos, from the book of Amos, that in the last days that God would raise up the tabernacle of David. Now, David did not actually build what you say a tabernacle like the Mosaical tabernacle. The tabernacle of Moses was erected at the, at the, at the direction of God. And what it did, it gave us the law, it showed us the holiness and the righteousness of God. And uh, under King Saul, the, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the authority, the power, and the presence of God, was taken, and Saul didn't do anything about bringing it back. Well, when David became king, he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant back, into, back to Jerusalem because he wanted a place where he could get face-to-face -face with God and worship and praise and glorify God. Now, so when David goes and gets the ark and brings it back, he sets up a tent or a tabernacle for him to put the ark in. Now, listen. See, the, the law commanded there had to be sacrifices of animals and all that, remember? Is that right? So, oh, the, so the, the, the ark or the tabernacle of Moses, it was in Gibeah, Gibeah, and the priests were still offering the sacrifices for the people and doing all the Mosaical commands that God had given Moses to command the people to do. They was offering their sacrifices over there, but the ark was over here at Jerusalem with David. Now, what did David do? The Bible says that the priest is the only one that's allowed to go into the holy place. Is that right? And he only went once a year. But David went every day into the holy place. David was a king. He was a prophet. And God allowed him to be a priest. And what David did, he would go in that tabernacle, that, that tent that he raised up, and he would go in our commune with God. And it was in the presence of God that David began to understand and know God. That's why the Bible said David was a man that was after God's own heart. 
That's why the Bible, it means that he was, he had the mind of God. He thought like God. The thinking, the reflection, the emotions, and, and the compassion of God. It was in his going in there and sitting down and communing with God that he, lo- that he learned to really trust in God. Not only did he learn to trust in God, but as as the Bible says, he learned the heart of God. So what David did, he instituted worship. He started having worship 24-7. He started having worship, songs, instruments, and through the tabernacle of David, we learned that everybody has access to God through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says the veil that was rent, how many knows what that means? The veil between the holy place and, and, and the, the inner court was tore down, so that gives us access. Everybody has access to go into the very presence of God but not without praising God, not without worshiping God, and, not, and that's what David did. He instituted the praise and the worship of God. How did he know that? Because being in the presence of God, he learned that God wanted to communicate, that God wanted to, to talk with his people, that God wanted his people to love him and to worship him. And through all this process, David learned that he could really trust in God. Now, if I went back there and started smacking Shane around, I'm afraid that I would hit some resistance. And the big old boy standing over on the, ca- on the camera. And if I, David out in Kentucky, big, he's he big, muscular, Works in a rock quarry. He's got two daughters. He said, if anybody ever lays a hand on one of them daughters, they're going to deal with me. Well, how much greater is God? And that's why we have the 91st Psalm. It's a psalm of trust. And David knew how to not only love the Lord, not only praise God, not only magnify God, but he learned that he could fully put his, his entire life, his soul, his body, his mind, everything into the hand of God because he knew that God would watch over him. So that's why we have the 91st Psalm. So, verse 1. I searched the world, but it could not fill me. Man's empty praises and treasures that fade are never enough. All right, back there. Give me Psalms 91. One. <laughs> Michael thought Sonia was hard at him. He looked around, looked over at Sonia. <laughs> oh. He thought, my Lord, I better shape up. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Somebody say the Almighty. Well, I looked up the word Almighty. It means Shaddai, which is God. It means one who is seated in royalty, a leader or or ruler, He is the God of the mountains. Now, where did Israel, when God brought them out of bondage, where did they have to go to meet God? In the mountain, Mount Sinai. When when Moses got the the Ten Commandments, where did he get them at? In the mountains. (laughs) He's the God of the mountain. He's a God that is high, exalted, and lifted up. And it also, he is God, the destroyer of the enemies. He is God, Shaddai means he is a God of a destroyer of your enemies. Can y'all handle that? 
Is that all right that God is so high and so exalted and so lifted up that he, he is God which is a destroyer of your enemies? All you got to do is put him on him in faith. All you got to do is put him on him because he is a God, the destroyer of enemies. He is a God that is the self-sufficient one. The Bible says, I, I sit alone. There's no God beside me. There's none in front of me. There's none behind me. There's none that shall be created. I am God alone. I, the Bible says, God said, I sit upon the spear of my creation. Everybody knows what the spear is of the creation. Just look at your globe. That little spear goes up through there and holds the globe. And the globe well, that's where God sits right there. He looks down over the whole earth. The Bible says his eyes roam to and fro over the whole earth. Why? God's looking out for you. He's looking for your enemies. And when they're by the Bible, and when their cup of iniquity waxes full, then God is going to do something. I'm in the Bible, y'all. That's all I know. I don't know nothing else. He's a, he's a God that is self-sufficient. He is a God that nurtures babies. Ain't that good to know, Shana? Adam. He's a nurturer of babies. It also means God the Almighty One. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. What does that mean to you? Is he your hope? Is he your stronghold that shelters you? Are you sheltered in the arms of God? As the song says, I'm sheltered in the arms of God. Are you tied into God? Are you in God? Are you just half in and half out? Do you just serve God part, part of the time and the rest of the time? Live like the devil? You can't expect God to do that. I'm talking to people that sold out to God. I'm talking to people like David was sold out to God. He is my hope. He's my stronghold that shelters me or protects me. He's the only God for me. I don't need another God, do you? I don't need another God. He's the only God I need. And he is my competence. I'm competent today of one thing. I am heaven bound. I am a born again believer. And I know the Bible said that which I have committed unto God, he will keep unto that day. I know that I'm sealed unto the day of redemption. I know that my God is looking after me. I know, hallelujah to God, no weapon formed against me going to prosper. I know all of these things. Why do you know all this stuff? Confidence. Confidence in my time that I spend with God, things that God says to me, how God blesses me, and the word of God, the lamp and the light under my path. Hallelujah. I know this stuff. I'm not fretting. I'm not worried. I'm not discouraged. I'm not disappointed. I'm not ready to give up. What am I going to give up for? Huh? Why would I want to give up? Why would I want to keep not keep pressing and pushing my way into the kingdom of God? There's a real hell. It's reality. <laughs> Y'all don't think I don't never get discouraged. Oh, yeah. When a bunch of people ain't in church, it discourages me. I have a revival. People stay home when they're just sitting home watching television and doing things of the natural. Yes, that discourages me because they don't have a heart for their church. But you think that's going to stop me? <laughs> Lord, no. It ain't going to stop me. Because I'm fixed. I am in a fixed position and I got my eyes on the prize and the high calling of God. And come March 10th, I'll be 72 years old. And I, I know I'm getting older. Me and Jack, Jack was talking this morning. 
You know, to die is just a quick trip to heaven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'll tell you what, a safe place is in Christ, our Savior. Verse 3 says, Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. What does that mean? He will rescue me from all mouthing accusations, false accusations that come against us. He will rescue me from every hidden trap of the enemy. See, the enemy thinks, that, uh, you know, this, this globalist bunch is up in co Congress now, and Canada and, and uh, these other st nations. They think they got it under control. They're, they're under the influence of the Antichrist spirit. And they've got all these laid out plans how they're going to take all of our freedoms and do all this kind of stuff and bring us under their subjection because they're the lead of the world, because they are financially secure. Well, I got news for them. Every plot, I was prophesying, God said, I was prophesying here one time, and God said, I've seen the deals they made with a wink of an eye. Y'all might not remember that, but I do. God said, I've seen every, every, every deal they made, every plan they made, even those that those they made with a blink of an eye. See, there ain't nothing hid from God. And God says, I'm going to protect you from all this stuff. Now, sound like a pretty good deal to me. Number four, he shall cover thee with his feathers under his wings, shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Does that mean God? has wings, not necessarily. It doesn't mean God's got wings to hide you under, but simply God be what he wants to be. But the wings, if we go into the scriptures, we find out that the wings, what's over the mercy seat? Huh? Cherubims. And God said, spread their wings out. And what is... And where does, give, give me uh, Exodus 25, 18 through 22. How you bow under the shadow of the Almighty and his, under, the, under his wings. And here's what it says in Exodus. He said, and thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, a beaten work that shall make them in two ends of the mercy seat. Remember when Jesus died, he ascended into heaven and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat? A lot of people get grace and mercy mixed up. If, uh, if you're in a, getting ready to be run over a tractor and trailer and, and God moves you out of the way, that's mercy, it's not grace. Grace is when you're spied from something. Grace is when you, uh, mercy is when you're spied from something. And grace is when God influenced you in the right realm. Now, so what he's saying here, thou shalt make two cherubims of gold to beat work, and thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherubim on the one end, and another cherubim on the other end, even at the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims, go ahead, on, two ends are up. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their, their wings on high, covering the mercy seat, and with, the, with their wings and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, and shall the face of the cherubims be, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark where the, all the good things of God reside is in the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, the word of God is in the ark, and there I will meet with thee. Now, where's God going to meet with you? At the mercy seat, which is covered by the wings. So what God is saying, I will, there I will meet with thee. I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat and from between the two cherubims, which are up on the ark of the testimony of all things, which I give thee in commandment unto Jehovah Israel. So what God is saying, that we can come to the mercy seat and we can crawl up under the, the, the cherubim's wings and God's right there. 
so we can find shelter, we can find protection, we can find everything that we need under the wings of the Almighty God because everything that's in the ark is covered by the cherubims and their wings are spread out to cover the cherubim, to cover the ark. So God is simply telling us that, that that's a good place to be. We can just get right under that mercy seat of God. And Hemi knows that mercy is what we need. I want mercy. I don't want judgment. I want mercy. When the enemy's coming at me, I want to be able to go to God and get mercy. Do you understand what he's trying to tell us here? We can get mercy. We can get under the ark of the covenant where all the promises of God are what? Yay and amen. And we can get under the mercy seat of God where nothing can touch us, nothing can come. But see, a lot of people, they just, oh, hallelujah. Instead of going and getting in the presence of God, I told y'all this, I'm gonna tell it again. We lost Daryl out of the church and that broke my heart. I had two sisters in the hospital, not in good shape at all. Of course, me and Susan, we, we got COVID. <laughs> all this going on. And I was down and out. Where, I mean, it hurt me about Daryl and other people that I was affiliated with was in on respirators and dying and this, that, and the other. And, and, and it really, I just really down. I didn't, I didn't say, oh God, <laughs> oh God, I can't believe you're allowing this happen to me. God, why, why God are you allowing all this? Why God, why, why are you doing this? God, why, I didn't do that. I went down in my man cave. I went in my bedroom. I took my shoes off as I always do. I don't go in there with shoes on because that's my holy place. I laid down on the bed and I think I, I looked at the clock and it was maybe 20 minutes. I did not do nothing but praise and worship God. I, ha I didn't know I had so much to thank God I, until I started thanking him. I started thinking about my children saved. I started thanking him and praising him and glorifying him and exalting him. And like I say, I think I prayed just praises to God for 20 minutes. That's how much I had to thank God for. I thank God when I, about my childhood, about the mom and dad I had, the, the field and the woods I had to go out in and hunt. I thank God I was able to play sports. I, I thank God for everything. I just thanked and praised God. And when I come out of that man cave, man, Woo. <laughs> I was feeling good. But see what a lot of people do? When they get under the hot spot, instead of getting under the wings of the Almighty God at the mercy seat where all the covenants of God, the promises of God is, they just sit down and, and let and, and the devil just plays them a violin and they just oh 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 pitiful. 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 You're a pitiful. You need to know what the Bible says. The Bible says use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You are to take the sword of the Spirit into your hands, not my hands. Don't, don't call me. Oh, Brother Mike, you gotta pray for me. Pray for yourself first, then call me. Sister Boss, I might be mean. No, okay, good. I don't wanna be mean. I'm trying to teach you how to survive in this hour that we're in. It's not sitting down and having a pity party. It's rising up like a great warrior of God that you are. Everybody say this. I am a great warrior. I have the word of God. And you use it. Now, if the Bible says, not Mike, if the Bible says that if you draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to you. If you resist, do I have to go there and get a hold of Susan and demonstrate what resistance is? Y'all know what resistance is. And the Bible says, if you will draw nigh to God, 
You resist the devil, he'll flee from you. That doesn't mean just that he'll run away. That means he will scurry off for safety. For safety. Somebody say safety. When you're in the presence of God and you're resisting the devil, he wants to get away from you. He don't want to harass you. He don't want to torment you. He wants to get away from you. Come on, come on, think about it. Has he ever wanted to get away from you? Huh? Have you you put him on the run? You know, people talk, I was telling Susan the other night, I said, you know, it's hard to believe that I was raised until I was 12 years old without a bathroom. I took a bath in a washing tub. The most popular books in our outhouse was Spiegel's catalog, Montgomery Ward, and Spiegel. That was our toilet paper. I didn't know if they did make toilet paper, to be honest with you. I know they didn't in Free Virginia. That's hard to believe, ain't it? I grew up like that. Yep, man, Montgomery Ward was popular, Spiegel. If you was out, you didn't look for, you look for catalogs when you find one. You ain't gonna use that, let me have it. Oh, newspaper was a dainty. <laughs> hey, believe it or not, I, when I was praising God, I even praised him for them times. That was glorious time that my dad had to sit outside on Halloween, guard the toilet, keep him by turning it over. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, John? I'm just almost 72, y'all. Now y'all know why I'm so country, okay? Susan was on the phone talking with somebody. I heard, no. I said, that's got to be Angeline. That's my sister. She said it is. (laughs) No. That's our language. Can't help it. Susan said, you could do better if you tried. Well, I don't think y'all want me to try, do you? Y'all understand me? Y'all know what gnaw is. (laughs) Praise God. So, God has got us in a pretty good place. You have access to the mercy, to the promises of God, to angelic help. You have access to that. Verse 5 says, verse 5, Psalms 91, Michael, you're getting ahead of the game there, buddy. We do, verse 5 says, Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor of the hour that flieth at day. You shall what? You shall not be afraid. We don't need to fear over demonic attacks. You don't need to go into fits because they got no power against you. Right. Yeah. You know, some people just go to pieces if they ain't think the devil's around. But that's what the Bible says. We don't need to fear over, do, over any kind of demonic attacks or anything like that because they, their weapons, can, they have no power or force against you. Amen. What happened when they saw Jesus coming? I know who you are, Holy One of God. I, the devil's told me a few times, I know who you are. Good, I'm glad you do. I 
I, I can't remember where I was. It's another state. I was casting devils out. And he talked to me. He said, I know who you are. I think he talked to Amy one time and said, I know who your daddy is. It's good to know that the devil knows who you are. You know what the devil knows about some of you? Hey, let's go have some fun. Let's go torment these people. They don't never put up no resistance. They just have a pity party. I'll play the violin. You torment them. Am I telling the truth? Am I telling you the truth? That's the way it is with some folks. I was in Alabama one time preaching, and I'd been uh, come out of the service and everything, and I went to bed that night. And all of a sudden, a black image appeared to me, just a black, just a black-looking thing. You know what I did? I went. <laughs> no, I didn't. I turned my back to it and said, "The Lord." rebukes you. <laughs> I didn't go to pieces. Amen. I'm a warrior. I'm covered by the blood and so are you. Amen. You're sealed by the Holy Ghost. Your weapons are not carnal, so what's the problem here? We should be a powerhouse for God. The Bible said the gates of hell should not prevail against my church. Verse 6, nor for the pleasant that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. It doesn't matter if natural forces or, or spirit forces. They can't overtake you. That's what that simply means. If it's natural or it's in the spirit realm, they cannot overtake you. God will make a way of escape. God says he'll turn everything into bad that's good for you. He'll make it good. We might go through, we go through problems, we go through trials, we go through stuff. Everybody does. But what we do, we, it, we do not allow it to make us a victim. We know that God is, says, all things work to the good of them who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. Some people lose a mom or dad or something, they just go into chaos. Well, I've lost a mother, a dad, two brothers, and a daughter that a girl I practically raised. And I guarantee you didn't love yours more than I love mine. <laughs> but it's, the, it's reality, it's life. Well, you believe it or not, this man right here is going to die one day unless the rapture comes. Will you miss me, Nate? Okay. I'm glad Nada missed me. <laughs> but it's reality. It's just, it's part of life. But we take it and make something else out of it and want to question why. Well, you know, somebody dies, like my nephew just died, 47 years old. A freak accident. A freak accident. Accident. A vehicle comes off a tow truck, crosses the medium, hits Corey, kills him. A freak accident. Why am I going to say, God, why did you allow that to happen? It was a freak accident. I just thank God he's right with God. <laughs> he loved God. That's the great part about it. He just got, as Jack says, a quick trip to heaven. You know, I, I ain't no hurry to get there. I like doing what I'm doing this morning. I like trying to encourage y'all. I like trying to build y'all up in your, in your faith and let you realize, hey, you're not a stepping stone. You're not a doormat for the devil. You're a child of God. You're robed in what, robes of righteousness. White robes of righteousness at that. 
You don't need to let the devil dirty them things up. Rise up. My God, rise up. You got the Holy Ghost. I know everything don't go sweet and pretty for everybody. But a lot of things we bring on ourselves because of things we allow to go on. Amen? Amen. Go ahead. Preach on, Brother Mike. I'm going to pat myself on the back, but can't we? Come on, I need to get off sugar, I guess. I've been wanting to preach this for a while because it's a powerful psalm. And you need to read it when you're down and out. You need to read it and quote it over your house, your family. Verse 6, Nor for the pest that walks in darkness nor structure that wastes at noonday. Hallelujah to God. Verse 7 says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it ain't going to come nigh you. If that disaster comes, you might lose your house. I don't know. Just pray you don't. Just stand against it. Jesus stood up in the ship and rebuked the wind and the sea. They obeyed him. Elijah prayed it didn't rain. For three and a half years, he didn't rain until Elijah said it's going to rain. Peter walked on the water. Yeah, but he had Jesus. You got Jesus on the inside of you. The, Jesus said, if you say to the sick of my tree, be thou moved in the sea and believe it in thy heart and doubt it not, it shall move into the sea. See, we look at this stuff, that's heavy stuff, but God ain't wasting breath. God ain't wasting foolishness on scriptures. He means exactly what he says. I listen to a lot of William Branham stuff, and, and God, he questioned God about some of these things, and he was squirrel hunting one day. Wasn't killing any, loved squirrel hunt. God said, pick you out a place and believe there'll be a, squir- a squirrel there and there will be. He did. He looked, a squirrel appeared, and he picked a place where you wouldn't find a squirrel. Now, that sounds foolish to the natural mind, but it doesn't to the spiritual mind. He'd be praying, seeking God. He loved to hunt. And the Lord said, well, you want to kill today? He said, I want to kill a 10-point buck. He said, well, you're going to kill it today, and here's where you're going to kill it, and here's what you're going to be doing. And he'd tell the people around him, God told me I was going to kill a buck today and told me where I'd be at and, and, have, and all this stuff. And he'd tell them it happened just like he told them. The man, man was powerful in faith in God, but God come to him when he was just a little bitty child before he really understood anything, and he kept himself out of the world. He kept himself out of the world. He didn't spend his life in turn, in, entertain himself with the world. He entertained himself with God. Verse 8 says, Only with thy eyes shall, shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. At, as a spectator, you will see the judgment of the wicked. Do you believe that? As a spectator, give me Isaiah. (laughs) And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me for the worm shall not die, neither shall the fire be quenched, and they shall be abhorred until all flesh. That's hell. The righteous is going to look on the wicked. Oh, but here's, here's your thinking. Let me tell you what you're thinking. I don't want to look down on people I know burning in hell. That you're so foolish. 
you will be changed. You will not have a carnal nature. You will not think carnally. You will be like the angels of God. You will be thinking like God thinks. When God in Revelation, when God turns the water into blood and the, the men have to drink it, you know what the angels say? Worthy. Worthy, God. You're just to give them blood to drink because they shed the blood of your people. See, God, we, 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 we got to get out of thinking naturally. Amen. Well, you don't think it's for the Abraham. Rich man, poor man died. Poor man over in Abraham's bosom looks over, in the, over between the great gulf fix, looks over to hell and see, see the, the man that he sat at his gate in torment. Saw him in torment. And he, and he cried out, the man in torment cried out. He said, man, I can't do nothing for you. There's a great gulf fix between us. Can't do nothing for you. What they going to do, bad boy, bad boy, when Jesus comes for you? They think they got it in control. Oh, I think Isaiah 11 is a good chapter to read about the 11, 12 about God bringing judgment on the wicked. You think God's going to let all this fraud, lying and cheating and stealing and deception that's going on in, our, in our Canada, that's going on in our nation and the nations around the world. You think God is just going to let it just play out? No, God's got a time schedule. God's got a time and God is very long suffering and gentle waiting on everybody to repent if they would. But when their cup of iniquity gets to the brim, God's going to say, I've had enough and you're going to see God do some house cleaning. Give me Psalms 91, 9 and 10. Psalms 91, verses 9 and 10. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. Verse 10 says, Thou shalt no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. Why is that? Because we live our lives within the shadow of God. We live close to God. And, uh, and our secret hiding place is in God. So when we're in God, evil cannot prevail. That's what the Bible says. If you're in God, evil cannot prevail over you. Do you believe that? Either you believe it or you don't believe it. If you don't believe it, then evil will prevail over you. But it's time for you to stand up. It's time for me to stand up. It's time for every child of God to begin to stand up and stand their ground and put the devil in his place. That's hell, out of darkness. If you're going to bind him, cast him out, send him back to outer darkness. Don't fool with nothing else. Verse 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. You know, I dispatch angels of God before every service the night before. I dispatch the angels of God to go, be go before everybody and that we have no, no outside interference, no flesh interference, no, no satanic interference. I send the angels out. I say, go now. We have angels with special orders from God to defend you. The Bible teaches you that you have angels that they are to protect you and to defend you. You remember when Elijah and, and his running mate was encamped about by a bunch of Syrians? And that guy, he was scared to death. And he, he, God said, God opened this man's eyes. 
that he can see, that he will not be fearful. And he opened his eyes and the mountains around him was full of warring angels. You know, 185,000 Syrian armies. 185,000 had Jerusalem besieged. I mean, it didn't look good, y'all. It didn't look a bit pretty for Israel. You know what God did? 185,000 Syrians. God sent one angel. One. And he killed in one night 185,000 Syrian army men. Men of war, warriors, one angel. What you scared of? Give me Psalms. 34 and 7. Psalms 34 and 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him and delivereth them. Who does? The angel of the Lord. God needs to open all of our eyes, hit blow our minds, and we can see the angelic forces sitting around in here. The, I think it was this week, I believe, I had my back to the wall and I felt somebody push me on the back. And at my first thought was, what does Susan want? Then I realized no lights was turned on and she wasn't because she wouldn't only walk five feet at night without turning the light on. Because she didn't want to fall over her shoes that she lives, leaves here and there. I didn't, I knew what it was. Because why you know, because I'm talking to God about this. Uh, let me know my angel's here. And I felt a hand go on my, push me like that. I've seen the impression on the bed. Well, they've sat down. I ain't in no fairy tale, y'all. I think I got one more scripture. Give it to me. Uh, Galatians, maybe. Who gave himself for our sins. Who? Jesus. That he might deliver us. That who's going to deliver us? Jesus. From this present evil world. According to the will of God. It is the will of God to deliver us from this present and evil world. That's what it's all about, church. That's why we come to God. We're his children. Don't mess with mine. I don't care if they are in their 40s. Now, how much greater is God than all of us in here? Huh? Now, what you got to fret about, what you got to worry about, why are you troubled about? Why are you down and out? I've had a lot of reasons to be down and out. But I know Judah means praise. You can praise your way out of any pit. You can love God, praise God, and I guarantee you he will lift your soul. What we're talking about is a safe place. You're in the safest place. You, a person that is a Christian is in the safest place in this entire universe. 
you got angels around you. You've got God looking out for you. You've got everything you need. You have the word of God as a sword to def defend yourself. you got the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. You've got it all, church. We've got it all. Heard Forrest Gump say one time, that's all I got to say about that. Now, church, I preach this stuff. It's been in my spirit for two weeks. I wanted to preach this. Because you got to know who you are. You got to be, quit being bullied. Quit letting the devil bully you. How many think it's an awful thing for children to bully kids in school? Put your hand up if you think it's a bad. I think it's terrible. Some kids even go out and commit suicide. Is that right, sir? Because of being bullied. You know what? Why do I preach like this? Because some Christian people, they go out and commit suicide. They don't take their life. They quit God. They give up on God. Same thing as killing yourself. That's why I want you to be strong. I want you to realize who you are. I want you to realize you stand your own ground. Now, if you want to tolerate wickedness, that's up to you. But clean your house up. And for all you that are ahead of the house, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. If you're the breadwinner, if you're, if that you're the house and you're the one who keeps it functioning, God will hold you personally. I said God will hold you personally responsible. I'm in the Bible, y'all, for what goes on in your house. Why would God do such a thing? Because he don't want you to have no problems. He wants you to live a quiet and peaceful life. Amen. Word of God's sharp, ain't it? Oh, man, it'll cut you. It'll hurt you. I hope I, my intentions today was to strengthen you, to encourage you, to build you up in the Lord. And I hope I've done a good job at it. Okay? All right, let's all stand. Yeah. The children have prepared a couple of things. Whenever you would like to do it. When do they want to do it? Now they want to do it from everybody. Well, bring them up here. Trot them right up here. Hallelujah. Supper little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. The Bible says, except you become like one of these right here, you can't enter the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say that. There's a boy. Susan, please come up here. <laughs> we have something to give you, Susan. We made cards for you. In Sunday school, and we want to give them to you. Okay. And look, they all wrote their names. That's Piper. Go ahead, pass it to me. Here, Piper. Piper, did you write this? Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here you go. Here, Piper. Piper.
happy birthday is a good thing. <laughs> Give that microphone. Okay, well, you'll hold this one. And then y'all hold this Everybody can sing with okay, it. Hold it kind of low. Okay, like the first one we're going to do. Okay, one, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And happy birthday to you. Do you. Do you. Do you. Me. Elmer. The Bible tells me so. Little one, here we go. He is strong. Yes, he does love me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me.